All right, students, this will wrap it up. Welcome to my Special Topics Lecture 3 video series, which does a systematic review of uh, chapters 9 through 11 of the first half of general chemistry last semester. In this video, we're going to cover lots of exciting stuff, like the ideal gas law, a bunch of stuff like involving molecular orbitals, and the secret ingredient to McDonald's shakes, which I will give you a hint, is anus. <laughs> now, before I begin, I want to start by sharing with you a hilarious chemistry cat of the day from quickmeme.com. This one says, Avogadro went to the dentist with a problem. The dentist said, your solution is molar. Ha, 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 ha. All right, I also wanted to share with you a cool molecule of the day from the American Chemical Society's molecular portal. This one says, Malvine, the first synthetic organic dye, whose structure is shown here, was accidentally synthesized by W.H. Perkin, who was 18 years old at the time in 1856, while he was attempting to make quinine. Also known as aniline purple in Perkin's mauve, Malvine was soon used to dye silk and other textiles. In 1862, Queen Victoria popularized the color by wearing a Malvine dyed gown. Malvine consists of as many as 12 molecules. The one shown here is Malvine A. The exact structures of Malvines A and B were not determined until 1994. Other structures were identified and characterized from 1997 to 2008. Now after this series of lectures from our Special Topics 3 that will review chapters 9 through 11, you guys should be able to first determine which bond, a single, double, or triple is the shortest. Second, Draw resonance structures and identify the bond angles around different atoms in different resonance structures. Third, identify the molecular geometry of an atom in a molecule. Fourth, identify the orbital hybridization of an atom in a molecule. Fifth, determine if a molecule is polar or nonpolar. Sixth, perform calculations using the combined gas law and ideal gas law. And seventh, sort molecules from highest to lowest boiling point based on their intermolecular forces. That's the lineup. Let's go ahead and get started. Beginning with the subject that we all know and love, that of covalent bonding and orbital overlap. Okay, we don't really know and love it. But anyway, every time you see a single bond in a molecule, that bond is often called a sigma bond. This Greek little character here, by the way, is called a sigma. All double bonds contain one sigma and one pi bond. Triple bonds contain one sigma and two pi bonds. So here are some examples. You can see here that I've got a carbon-carbon triple and a carbon-hydrogen single. The carbon-carbon triple bond contains one sigma and two pi's, while the carbon-hydrogen single contains one sigma. Now just so you know, and this is very important, sigma bonds are stronger than pi bonds. However, a triple bond is overall stronger than a double bond because it has one sigma and two pi bonds. By the same logic, a double bond is a little stronger than a single bond. Typically, the stronger the bond, the shorter in length it is. With that as background, here's a question. Which of the following has the shortest carbon-carbon bond length? I'm not going to tell you the answer, but based on what I just taught you, you should be able to determine it on your own. Now, to resonance structures. This is a topic I've discussed before in general chemistry, though not as in-depth as I'm going to today. There are some molecules that have pi electrons that can move around from one atom to another. For example, the following molecules right here are both different forms of acetate. You can imagine form A, for example, having this negatively charged oxygen here that has an extra set of lone pairs on it. If it takes that negative charge and dumps it down here and closes to form a carbon-oxygen double bond, in doing so, it has to push up this set of pi electrons onto this oxygen. So this oxygen up here now has a formal negative one charge. So these are both different forms of acetate. In reality, this is happening back and forth and back and forth and back and forth at a virtually infinite speed for our finite minds to comprehend, at least. Now, structures A and B are called resonance structures. In reality, acetate actually exists somewhere in between A and B, with the negative charge being shared equally by the two oxygens. We sometimes draw acetate, then, in this manner. Now, drawing resonance structures is kind of like moving doors on a hinge. To show you this, I'd like to draw resonance structures for a few different molecules in the slides that follow. Before doing that, however, I need to tell you a few different rules. When drawing different resonance structures, please remember that only pi electrons, lone pair electrons, or negative charges can move. You can move electrons toward or into an atom that does not have a full octet. Now, by extension, you can only move electrons into an atom that already has a full octet if you have other electrons that push out in the opposite direction as you move those electrons in. In other words, electrons in, electrons out. Otherwise, you violate octets. And last is this rule. Do not break sigma bonds 
only pi bonds. Got these rules down? Let's take a look at some examples. This molecule here is called ethyl nitrate. If you take this negative charge on this oxygen, which is a formal negative charge caused by it having an extra set of lone pairs more than it normally does in a neutral state, you can imagine swinging these lone pairs down right here and closing to form a nitrogen-oxygen double bond. In doing so, however, you can't leave it that way because the nitrogen would now have 10 electrons around it, keeping in mind that each bond around it represents two electrons. So the only way you can have that swing down here and close to form a nitrogen-oxygen double bond is if you push these electrons up onto this oxygen, which converts this into a nitrogen-oxygen single bond and gives this top oxygen a formal negative one charge like this. So these are two resonance contributors. As I stated in the case of acetate, this molecule actually exists somewhere in between these two and can therefore be drawn in this manner. This is called a resonance hybrid. And it's sort of our attempt at showing the uh, structure that lies more or less halfway in between these two resonance structures or resonance contributors. Here are some other examples. You can imagine having this molecule, which is called acetone. And if I take these pi electrons right here and swing them up onto that oxygen, these pi electrons become a set of lone pairs. That oxygen now gets a formal negative one charge. This carbon right here, which has a full octet in the structure on the left, now no longer has a full octet in the structure on the right, so it now has a positive charge. Now take a look at this one. And you'll notice that I've got a carbon here that has a formal positive one charge. That means that that carbon lacks a full octet. I can have these electrons swing like a door on a hinge, and you can imagine a door sort of swinging, closing to form a carbon-carbon double bond right here to form this resonance contributor. When this occurs, the carbon at the left now has the form of positive charge because it just lost two electrons that it formerly was sharing. In reality, this molecule once again exists halfway in between these two, and these are both resonance structures or resonance contributors of this molecule. Let's contrast that molecule with this one in which I've got a double bond right here and a negative charge. Now remember, I cannot swing a double bond toward a negative charge because this negative charge represents a carbon that has a set of lone pairs on it. It already has eight electrons around it. I can't swing a double bond towards it or else I would have 10 electrons around that carbon. What I can do, however, is swing in the opposite direction. So this negative charge could swing down here to close forming a carbon-carbon double bond. Now I can't leave that because then the central carbon would have 10 electrons around it. The only way I could do that is by having this set of pi electrons swing out to give a negative charge on this terminal carbon like this. So once again, it's like a door in a hinge swings right here, closes to form a carbon-carbon double bond, and these swing out onto this carbon right here, giving it a formal negative charge. These are different resonance structures or resonance contributors. Here are some other examples. This first molecule is known as benzene, just so you know. I can imagine each of these double bonds swinging like a door in a hinge, that one swinging there to close, forming a carbon-carbon double bond, and then pushing this one over there and that one there. When that occurred, I would get this structure, which is a resonance contributor. In reality, benzene exists in between these two different resonance contributors or resonance structures. Here's another one. This molecule could potentially have a variety of different resonance structures. I'm only going to show one. I could imagine these pi electrons in this carbon-carbon double bond right here swinging like a door on a hinge and closing to form a carbon-carbon double bond here. This carbon right here already has eight electrons, so I can't do that and leave it. I can only have the electrons come in, and then these electrons go out. So these electrons swing up onto that oxygen. When that occurs, I get this with a formal negative charge in this oxygen up top that now has three lone pairs, a carbon-carbon double bond in between, and this carbon right here now having a formal positive one charge. That is an octet deficient carbon because it only has six electrons around it. It lost two electrons that it formerly was sharing when it was participating in this carbon-carbon double bond. Here's another example that strongly resembles the one I showed you earlier. You can imagine this oxygen with a formal negative one charge taking one of its set of lone pairs and throwing it down here to form a nitrogen-oxygen double bond. In doing that, however, it can't stay because that would give 10 electrons to this nitrogen, keeping in mind that each one of these bonds represents two electrons. This nitrogen already has two, four, six, eight electrons around it. So when this oxygen swings down and closes to form a nitrogen-oxygen double bond, it has to push these pi electrons up and onto this oxygen to give it a formal negative charge like this. So we got that swinging down there. These electrons go up on here, and that gives me this as a resonance contributor. Now you might be confused by this nitrogen having a plus one charge. Nitrogen with a plus one charge does not mean that it doesn't have a full octet. As you can see, this nitrogen totally does because it has four bonds around it. Nitrogen with a plus one charge, which is different from a carbon with a plus one charge, is a nitrogen that is sharing more electrons than it does in a neutral state. 
With that background, let's take a look at an example problem. Which of the following structures represents a correct resonance structure for molecule A? Now, I'm going to share with you the answer momentarily, but foremost, I'd like you to pause the video and see if you can figure it out on your own first. OK, here's the answer. You can imagine this nitrogen right here taking its lone pairs and swinging them like a door and a hinge and closing to form a nitrogen carbon bond right here. In doing so, the only way it can is if it takes these pi electrons and pushes them up onto that oxygen. When that happens, I've got a nitrogen carbon double bond here and a single bond to this oxygen right here. The new oxygen has a negative charge, which means that the correct answer is option A. Now, although we haven't drawn formal charges here, we've got a formal negative one charge on oxygen, a formal positive one charge on this nitrogen. I want to pause momentarily and ask you this question. What type of bond geometry would we expect to get around this nitrogen right here? It's got four things around it. So I've taught you in the past bond geometry right there would probably be about tetrahedral, wouldn't it? It's got four things around it. But what about this nitrogen right here? This nitrogen only has three things around it because its set of lone pairs has been pushed into here. So it's only got three things around it. It's got this carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen. Set of lone pairs has sort of uh, been removed in forming this resonance contributor. What would the bond geometry around that be? Well, that would not be tetrahedral. Is this, one, this one would be semi-tetrahedral. This one would be trigonal planar. So what does that tell you about this molecule? It tells you that in reality, the bond geometry around this, where you've got resonance uh, forms going back and forth and back and forth, is somewhere in between. We can summarize this idea with the following statement. Remember that in reality, actual molecules exist somewhere in between their various resonance structures. This means that the bond angles of atoms that have resonance will also be somewhere in between where they would normally be for each individual resonance structure. Let's take a look then at a question. What is the approximate hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon bond angle in molecule A? Now remember, if this were a completely isolated, non-resonancing, I'm not sure if that's a word, nitrogen atom, then this would be a nitrogen atom that has four things around it. So its bond angle would be somewhere up, would be somewhere around maybe a little bit less than 109.5, because it would have a tetrahedral geometry. This nitrogen, however, can resonance to localize or resonance push its electrons into here, forming a nitrogen carbon double bond, as we just saw. When those electrons are pushed down here, that nitrogen now no longer has four things around it. It has three things around it, and therefore has a trigonal planar geometry. Trigonal planar geometry has a bond angle of 120 degrees around each of those atoms. So what does that mean about the resulting structure? What is its bond angle going to be? Yeah, it's going to be somewhere in between the two. So the correct answer to this question is option C. And don't you forget it. That takes us to the end of this lecture video. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I will begin reminding you about molecular structures or molecule shapes. Until then, my beloved students, have a wonderful rest of your day.